Welcome to chapter 11 of the book of Numbers. The whole, whole book of Genesis is a history of man up until the time that the children of Israel went into Egypt. Joseph was the ruler of Egypt, second in charge, and the 12 brothers had sold him into slavery, but then uh, they went back to Egypt uh, because of a famine and found out that Joseph ruled, and it ended up with Jacob, the father, coming back with a family uh, from Canaan into Egypt where they stayed there for 400 years. And then the people came, uh, became, were put under servitude by the Pharaoh of Egypt, one that didn't know the people's beginning, and put them under servitude, harsh servitude as it is. And everything, they were going fine. They knew of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth. They, and, but nothing was written about that whole period of, of 400 years. All we know is what we can guess, and that would have been that what they had for Scripture was only what was in the book of Genesis, and it may well have just been an oral history of these people. If they, had, they didn't have a law, the law wasn't uh, designed, given to them by God until later here in, uh, book of, uh, in, in, the, in the other books of the Bible, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so they were living uh, as more or less like slaves in this uh, country uh, at the bottom of the totem pole, if you would. And uh, all of a sudden, they have a man that comes and tells them that he has talked to their God. Well, they didn't know who God was. Uh, they just knew it was a God that Abraham uh, had talked to, and the stories had been passed down, but there was nothing for 400 years. They probably, you know, it was just a story for 400 years ago. Nothing to it. Now, all of a sudden, a man comes, and he says that there is a God, their God, and his name is Oon, the being one, the one being, and he is Kyrios, he is Lord. And he gave them, in the last couple of chapters, this, a rod turns into a serpent, a hand that would go in and out of his bosom and turn into leprosy, and water that would turn into blood. Sounded good to them. They didn't see anything like that. And so the story goes now, and uh, the people uh, in Exodus, they um, ended up uh, going through the plagues and uh, grumbling to um, God, grumbling to, I'm sorry, grumbling uh, to, to, get you, to God against Moses for causing all this hardship to be put on them by the Pharaoh. And then when the people uh, were finally uh, left to leave, uh, at the Passover and uh, the firstborn of the, all the sons of the Egyptians were put to death, then they left with all the goods and they went out into the wilderness. And as soon as they went out into the wilderness, something important happened. And the relationship to that example, which I'm going to bring out here in a second, is amazing because in history before here, we had basically uh, the Mesopotamian uh, gods and there were the gods in India, the uh, the Hindus, gods, and then in Far East, in, uh, in Japan, the emperor was a god. And then the Greeks made their own gods, which were around this time, the, with um, anthropomorphic um, types of gods that were like humans, the Titans and the Olympians. And then, uh, and then there were the people that uh, God talked to and said that he was a creator and gave the creation story to these people. And they knew the creation story and everything, Noah's flood and so forth. And they found out now that they had this special relationship with God. Now, other peoples that had a special relationship with God, you don't hear them complaining against the God, uh, their God. They don't sit there and, and grumble. But these people begin 
uh, they began or before here, and I'll show you right here, the grumble. And I'm putting together a book or a treatise, whatever you would uh, call it. It's going to be called Theomachy. And eventually I think it'll be a book. God wills it to be. And it's all the places where this these people who were chosen by God fought against God. That's what this means, a machi, a war against God. Now, it's not just any God, but it's the God, the, the creator God, uh, the God of Israel, their father. But yet all they do is war against him in so many places. And it goes on and on and on. And as I go through all the rest of the, uh, the Bible here, as we go through, uh, through unto the kings, we already went through the, um, uh, the um, prophets, so you see all the warring against God there. But I'm going to bring out all the places. And this Theomachy is going to probably be the most anti-Semitic book ever written because uh, the most anti-Semitic being ever was God. And he uh, had nothing but problems with these people. Uh, other people didn't believe, and the Hindus and all these people, they didn't even, so they didn't have this kind of an anti-God feeling. And I'm going to show where it brings it out, and it's going to be in the Bible. It's not going to be my words, but it will be what, what we'll see written in the Bible, and it will go down until the... Uh, end of uh, of time in re- the book of Revelation. And so as we go through now, I'll bring this out. The reason I'm bringing this out, because this is the uh, first place in uh, Numbers uh, that it appears. And so basically earlier we had in Exodus, God uh, foresaw, the, foresaw the rebellion of the Jews, and he sent them away from the Philistines in war. So they wouldn't, uh, because they would go back and be afraid of the Philistines. And then uh, they they feared before the Egyptian army and they blamed Moses, but they trusted in the Lord uh, and Moses in verse 31. So that was a sort of a uh, a beginning of it. But then in Acts 16:3 they complained to uh, Moses and they're grumbling against God. It says, and then in 16:28 the Lord complains of their disobedience, and then the people revile against Moses for lack of water. And at Horeb, uh, when they come here, going to uh, the mountain where they're at now, and then the golden calf, uh, they revolted against God, set up another god, the calf gods. And then uh, God gives a condemnation of this people in 33, 3 and 5. And now in uh, Numbers 11, 1, we have a combustion and tombs of desire. So with that, we'll go into this chapter, and it begins, and the people were grumbling. Gogi zone, wickedly, before the Lord. And the Lord heard, and he became enraged in orgy, anger. We have an orgy, it's a, uh, the word means today is this a, a, a sexual excitement type thing, but it was uh, anger, exciting, mad, or, uh, upset. And there burned among them, the Jews, a fire by the Lord. And it devoured a certain part of the camp. Now, whether this fire was started by nature and they, they, they um, attribute it to God or Moses attributed it to God, or maybe God said he would do this, allow this to happen. However, it happened, um, it, it did happen. We're told a fire by the Lord and it devoured a certain part of the camp. And this camp was large, a million people. And the people cried out to Moses. And Moses made a vow to Curion. And the fire abated. So Moses, again, is in between the people uh, and uh, goes to God, and he stops the fire. Uh, and he, that is probably, uh, Moses called the name of that place combustion, and pirismos in the Greek, for fire by the Lord burned among them. So this was uh, here around at Horeb after they left three days, maybe a little longer, someplace in that period of time after they were leaving. Uh, and the intermixed people among them desired with a great desire. They wanted something. What? And being seated, uh, they wept along with the sons of Israel and said, well, who will feed us meats? So this is what they desired was meat. All they had was manna. And then they said, we remember the Ichthyos, the fishes which we ate in Egypt without charge, 
and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlics. But now our soul is dried up. There is nothing except for the manna to our eyes. Uh, now, I highlighted ichthyos, fish, because um, this is, without the A in there, iota, he, theta, epsilon, sigma, is, uh, you'll see a, f- a fish diagram on cars today in certain places, and some of them have this Greek word in it, and I had one on my car years ago, and the early Christians in the caves in Rome and places, uh, that was a, there wasn't a cross as we know it, but it was a fish. And inside was the Greek letters, iota, chi, theta, epsilon, sigma. And it, what it standed for is e, Jesus, Jesus, chi, chi, uh, Christos, Christ, theta, theos, God, eo, son, and then I got no a in the, in the, in the nominative, and sigma, sotir, savior, Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior. So I just thought I'd bring that out to show it to you. So now the manna, that's all they had. And the manna is as a coriander seed, and the appearance of it is as the appearance of crystallu, crystal or ice, some type of a uh, bakery good that would, would probably shine, sparkle. And the people traveled around and collected together and ground it by the millstone and ground it by the hand mill. And they boiled it in an earthen pot and made it into a cake baked in hot ashes. So this is what they had now. It's only for a year, one year. And the satisfaction of it was as the taste of pastry made from out of olive oil. Almost sounds like a croissant. Which I love. And whenever the dew came down upon the camp at night, the manna came down upon it. Uh, that is, it, co- it came down upon the dew uh, at night. And Moses heard their weeping, according to their themus peoples, uh, each at his door at the tent. And the anger of the Lord was enraged exceedingly. And before Moses, it was wicked. And so now a second time, the Lord is exceedingly angry, almost the same place. And Moses said to the Lord, well, why do you afflict your attendant, a theraponta, sue, therapon, therapeutics, attendant? And why have I not found favor before you to place the thrust of this people upon me? <laughs> why is it coming on me? Why am I getting this? Have I conceived in the womb all this people? Or have I given birth to them that you say to me? Well, take them into your bosom as a wet nurse lifts the one being nursed unto a land which you swore by an oath to their fathers. Am I, take a, am I taking them in my bosom and nursing them as a baby? Would a nurse would nurse a baby? And then taking care of them into this land uh, that you swore their fathers? They didn't say my, our fathers or my fathers. From what place is it to me to give meats to all this people? I I can't do that. For they weep upon me, saying, Give to us meats that we may eat. In the imperative, give to us meats that we may eat. Give to us meats that we may eat. I can hear them all, thousands of people yelling at them. Boy, how would you like that? Tens of thousands. Uh, I look at the President of the United States right now. He's got half the country after him. Other half like them, other half don't, and yell and scream and all this stuff. Imagine everybody being against you. It's a horrible place to be. Poor Moses, what did I do? I shall not be able alone to bring this people into the land, for uh, it's a heavy for me. The matter, This matter is heavy for me. But if so you do to me, kill me with my removal if I have found favor with you that I should not see my ill treatment. (laughs) If you like me, then just get rid of me. Let me die. And if I have found favor in that, so I'm not going to see any more of this ill treatment and people walking away. I mean, it's terrible what they were doing. Here are the chosen people of God right away, right away within a year complaining. They were doing it before. And so, uh, and this is a, 
modus operandi of the Jews ever since. Just constant, constant, constant complaining against God. Hardly ever the opposite. But when it is, we'll bring it out. And the Lord said to Moses, we'll bring together synagogue, a synagogue is the verbal form, bring together to me, or gather, synagogue, uh, uh, a gather to me, could be a gather to me, uh, 70 andras, men from the presbyteron of Israel, the elders, whom you yourself know. Uh, these men are going to be, you know, people that you know who they are, and upstanding men and so forth. These are elders of the people and their scribes. Grammatis, grammar comes from that word. And you shall lead them to the skinny, the tent of the martyrio, testimony. So they had that tent. They just set it up. Now they're to bring these 70 men there. And they shall stand there with you around about that tent. And I shall go down and speak there with you. And I will remove from the Spirit upon you, and I will place it upon them. And they shall aid with you the thrust of this people. So they'll be able to deal with it also. And you alone shall not bring them. So he sends uh, these 70 men to help uh, be on the side of Moses. Then, he says, and to the people you shall say, purify yourselves for tomorrow. Purify yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meats. For you wept before the Lord, saying, who shall feed us meats? For it was good to us in Egypt. And the Lord shall give to you meats, and you shall eat. And you shall not eat, uh, you shall not eat for one day, nor two, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days. You shall eat for a month of days until whenever it should come forth from out of your nostrils. And it shall be to you for a cholera, and you can add that to your English derivatives book, holeron, cholera. And a cholera is a, basically it's a bacterial disease of the intestines that causes a diarrhea and a vomiting. Uh, that you resisted the Lord who was among you, and you wept before him, saying, What did we do? Uh, and the, this should be italicized. What did we do to come from out of Egypt? What did we do? Why, why should we have come out, be treated like, and not have anything? And Moses said, 600,000 footmen are the people in which I am among them. 600, that's just the army, the footmen not other people too. And you said to God, you said, I'll give them, I'll give of to them meats and they shall eat for a month of days. <laughs> what? Shall sheep and oxen be slain for them? And will it suffice to them? Have you heard that someplace before? <laughs> yeah. On the Mount of, with Jesus uh, feeding the 5,000 and the, was the 7,000 and, uh, and the disciples, <laughs> we have a couple of pieces of bread and, a couple of small fishes. How are we going to feed anybody this big? So, uh, but here, uh, but yet the people then didn't believe, and here they still don't believe. Or shall all the fish of the sea uh, be brought to them, and will it suffice to them? So Moses is doubting how this is going to happen. How could this possibly be? And the Lord said to Moses, Shall the hand of the Lord not be enough? Basically, is my hand unable to do whatever it wants to do? Already you shall know if my word shall overtake you or not. And Moses came forth and he spoke to the people the sayings of the Lord. And he brought together 75 men from the elders of the people and stood them round about the tent. And the Lord came down in a cloud and he spoke to Moses, him, and he lifted from the spirit upon him and placed it upon the 70 men of the presbyterus, elders. And as spirit rested, pneuma, spirit, pneumatics, powerful spirit of God, rested upon them that they prophesied. No, doesn't say anything about tongues here, languages. And no longer uh, proceeded. Now exactly what they, 
what I don't know exactly what that means, but they did no longer proceed. So, somehow something stopped. And we're left behind a two men, Theo, Andres, Duo, two, and an android comes from those words in the camp. The name to the one was Eldad, and the name to the second, Devteru, Deuteronomy, so word Deutero, was Modad. And the spirit rested upon them. The Panevma rested upon these men, and these were of ones of the ones uh, delineated and came not to the tent. They weren't of the 70. And they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran up to report to Moses and said, Eldad and Medad prophesy in the camp. And answering, Esus, this is the same word as Jesus, Joshua, Esus, the son of Navi, the one standing beside Moses, his elect, chosen one, eclectos, said, Kyrie, O my master Moses, restrain them. Where did you hear that before? It was like uh, the same thing in the New Testament where somebody was prophesying and James and John said that they should stop them. But Jesus said, you know, it's, no, I don't, if anybody is prophesying in my name, they can't do it uh, without, uh, for a period of time without his uh, permission, basically. And that's in the New Testament. I should have gotten uh, those places to show I could show it to you. But those, but this is also uh, reflects into the New Testament. And Moses said to him, Joshua, are you zealous, sue me? Are you zealous? We have the, the uh, transliteration, excuse me. A zealous, zealous. For me? And, oh, how it would be given all the people of the Lord were prophets. Oh, how that we would all prophesy of the people. And prophecy is a high calling even to the people of the church in the New Testament. The prophets up at the top. Prophesying isn't always telling the future. It's speaking the word of God as God is speaking it, I believe, to a person. I could be prophesying now. If God is putting the words in me and they are going out to you, then I would be prophesying (coughs) because it would be God speaking through somebody, a prophet. And then, uh, oh, would it? Oh, it would be given all the people of the Lord were prophets, even today, whenever the Lord should put his penevma upon them, and his spirit is upon all of us, so that we were prophesying. To prophesy today in the Lord and speak in his words, a lot of people just make things up and say the Lord said this or the Lord said that, and anybody could say it, and you wouldn't know unless it was a prophecy of the future that could either take place or not, and then if it didn't, you know it was a false prophet, and if it did, it was a true prophecy. But uh, if a person is speaking in a place that allowing God's Spirit to speak through them, uh, that is another prophet. And Moses went forth into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Now, how would you know if that was a true prophet? Well, these men knew that Eldad and Medad were Uh, prophesying. How did they know that there was a prophesying? Spirit rested upon them. And uh, and he said, El Dada made Dad prophesy in the camp. So they were doing something, and they could tell that God was speaking through them. And Moses went forth into the camp, he and the presbytery, the elders, the 70 elders of Israel. And a penevma, here we have a wind. Instead, you could say it's spirit also, went forth from the Lord, Uh, but I don't see that. I think that's wind. It's a breath also. Penevma can be a breath like that, a blowing breath. That would be the penevma, my breath, my penevma, or uh, the wind, penevma, or spirit of a power going through that's, uh, Jesus says you can't see it, but you can't see the wind either, but it happens. And what did the wind do? It went forth from the Lord, and it carried over mother quail from the sea. So that all of a sudden, all these mother quail by the sea, just millions of them, blows them all over towards uh, where they were in the camp. So which shows to me that they were not very far from uh, the sea. Let me see if I can find that uh, 
map from uh, the last uh, there it is, Jebel bin Jebel bin Bashar. This is where they were, someplace out in here, in the wilderness as they go through three days' journey. So they're out in here, combustion. So the wind came from the sea. So you can see it's not very far. If it was way, way, way down at the very tip, like people like to think it is because there's a high mountain down there, uh, then that would be, uh, uh, that would not, to me, wouldn't make sense. Because here it makes a tremendous amount of sense because the wind just brought the birds over. And uh, it put them upon the camp. And it was a day's journey. That's how many there were. They're so far out. You walk out for a whole day and there are birds here on this side and a day's journey here on that side, round about the camp, about two cubits from the earth. So these birds were flying at three feet high, just a perfect height to have a bat and go whammo, knock the bird and kill it. And the people rose up the, that entire day and that entire Nikta night. Olin is whole, there's a derivative, the entire next day, and gathered together the mother quail. <clears throat> the one gathering a few was ten cores, and I don't know how big ten cores is, but that was a lot. And they cooled themselves in a time of refreshing round about the camp, tired themselves out. <clears throat> Reminds me of those rat terriers. They dug up this big field with all these rats, and these terriers spent all day long grabbing a rat and crunching down and shaking their head and dropping it. And they put them 300 in a pile of all these rats. And these uh, rat terriers, at the end of the day, they were exhausted. <laughs> so these people were like those rat terriers, exhausted. And the meat was still in their teeth before the dissipating. So they were looks like they were eating it raw, which would explain the cholera, the dysentery and diarrhea, vomiting. And the Lord was enraged in wrath, again, Argi, in wrath at the people. So again, we have God third time here in this book. And the Lord struck the people an exceedingly great calamity, a plague, a plague. And the name of that place was called Tombs of Desire, Minimata Tis Epithemias. For there they entombed the craving people. So many people died in these two places, combustion and tombs of desire where the Lord was angry. And then it says, uh, from tombs of the desire, the people lifted away unto Asiroth, and the people existed in Asiroth, Hazaroth. <clears throat> so now the next chapter is really very interesting. Chapter, not the people, but the family comes against Moses. As Jesus says, a prophet is only without honor in his own city, and his own people. We'll find out about that. Chapter 12, next video seminar. Hope you'll watch it. God bless.